Set point for McEnroe. Oh. Pause here. Shia LaBeouf's legs are a little skinny. I was like, why does he, th can't they, you know, beef up his legs or something? Because my legs weren't that skinny. Um, so that was sort of disappointing. Hi, this is John McEnroe. Today, I'm gonna be reviewing tennis scenes in movies. And here's the breakdown. Battle of the Sexes. Here we go. <laughs> My initial thoughts on that movie, pretty good movie. I thought those actors did a pretty good job playing tennis, all things considered. We used to think growing up, by the way, that Bobby Riggs, who was a big gambler, we knew of his gambling exploits, that he, we, or at least we were hoping, he threw the match on purpose. Because we were like, oh my God, you know, a Billie Jean King, a girl beat Bobby Riggs. People forget that Bobby Riggs had beaten Margaret Court a few months earlier, like six months early in a match, so this was her way to prove, look, I gotta do it for all the female tennis players out there. I became a father later, obviously, but I had four girls so uh, and two boys. And so from that uh, aspect alone, I really sort of empathized and related and was happy that as it turned out, Billie Jean ended up winning that match. Although I've had to hear it for the last 25 years that Serena would have beaten me. So don't like that part, but besides that, pretty darn good movie. Tough to recreate uh, the action on a tennis court. All in all, maybe a little bit slow motion, but that's sort of the way we played then, I guess. Uh, we did have, only have wood rackets, so I'd say they did a pretty good job all in all. I right, got a soft spot for this one. Borg versus McEnroe. Stand by it. As a matter of fact, um, I've got even a story about the chalk uh, when it flew up, uh, et cetera, which by the way, it flew up more than once, but they remember one. Uh, last year ESPN on the 40th anniversary of the match that I did win, they had a bunch of people sort of congratulating me, like a short little video at the end and doing clips like, you cannot be, you know, imitating me, players of today. And at the very end of it, uh, Tom Gullickson, who was my opponent that year in the first round where all this transpired, says, reveal, I gotta make a confession, John was right and the ball was in. And I was like, thank you, Lord. It took 40 years, but I think it was worth the wait. Tennis was surprisingly semi-solid, you know, considering what it could have been. I, he was better than the Borg character uh, in terms of the tennis part. I had a question, I was like, why is this? I mean, and I know we're not, you know, Borg was one of the greatest athletes ever and super fit and stuff but we weren't that radically different the way we looked. And you know, this other guy, whoever played Borg was like this, you know, Viking God and unbelievable doing, you know, pull-ups, you know, with one finger. And you know, Shia LaBeouf's legs are a little skinny. I was like, why does he, can't they, you know, beef up his legs or something? Cause my legs weren't that skinny. Um, so that was sort of disappointing. Um, again, you can see in this movie, um, the tennis part of it is difficult to duplicate, uh, very difficult. It was sort of cool because I know Bjorn's son was in it, played his son when he was um, younger, when he had allegedly anger issues, which is hard to believe with Bjorn because you never saw him do anything, but I guess at one point he got mad. And then um, there was a couple things in the movie also that ended up where you're like, did that happen? Because I don't think it happened. I'll, I'll tell you one in particular, this last, story to this. We had uh, the closing scene in the movie. I'm watching this movie, I hadn't watched it. I think I was on the plane somewhere. And lo and behold, there's this scene at the end where we played Wimbledon and uh, the next morning we're at the airport and we just happened to run into each other. Didn't happen. So I'm like, why the hell did they have to put that in there? Because it didn't happen. I mean, it was sort of cool though, I guess, you know, artistic license, I guess. It's not like, whoa, they're making everything up because uh, uh, we met at the airport, but it, we didn't really meet at the airport. And then soon after that, I, I, I feel like it was only a few weeks after, and it was at Wimbledon, 
We were going to, uh, my wife and I were going to the airport and we were a little bit early for the flight. So I saw like, let's go get a cup of coffee. And so we sit down the cup of coffee and then all of a sudden I hear, John, John. And I look over at this, you know, place, another place right like 10 feet away and it's Bjorn with his wife. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. We just met like at a sheer coincidence at this airport. So then I thought, well, this movie was like 40 years ago or 35 years ago or whatever it was. Maybe that did happen. I think it was the only time in 40 years that we've been traveling together. We happened to be like, you know, sitting 10 feet from each other. It feels like at this point uh, that I probably had 100,000 people. I was in the stadium when you played that match against Bjornberger. It was a 15,000 seat stadium. How, how is that possible? But uh, as far as the tennis and the sequencing of the tennis, um, I feel like um, I think they did a good job with the sort of uh, what was happening in the crowd. Because, you know, I, I've got to say, uh, I'll close uh, this movie story with this, is that the truth is, is that there's only a few matches in my life where you felt like, wow, something unbelievable is happening while it's happening. You're so caught up in it most of the time that you don't even realize maybe that it's going to go down in the history books. That one, I did feel uh, that something spectacular and special was going on in uh, the match, during the match. And I felt like to some degree the movie succeeded in doing that. King Richard. This is unquestionably to me the best tennis movie I've ever seen. I hate to say that since there's one Borg versus McEnroe. But this story is a story that comes along like literally once in a hundred years. The idea that uh, Richard Williams could watch an old friend of mine, actually Virginia Ruzic, who was a French Open champion in 1978, I believe it was, receive a check for $10,000. I mean, you know, and, and say, decide at that time, my two youngest girls, I'm gonna have two girls. Not only, I haven't even had them yet. I'm gonna have two girls and I'm gonna make not one, but both of them, you know, legendary tennis players. You'd be like, <laughs> very funny. Tell me another story. That's a nice dream. Fast forward a little bit. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. The clip where uh, my coach at that time in 1989 says to me, we got these two young girls coming over and they're gonna be the best players in the world. It won't take but a minute to watch them hit a few balls. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not taking any juniors right now when we were in the well, middle of a very really serious practice. Uh, Matt, Pete, oh, tough break at Wimbledon. I see what happened to you, Matt. They trot on over and here's Venus and Serena Williams, uh, as little girls. So I was there, I said at the time, all right, let's see what you got. Obviously, what am I gonna walk away and not see what they got when they've come over? Come on. But for some reason, I had to be the bad guy in this and be like, ah, oh, forget it. I can't handle like stopping practice for 10 minutes. Are you kidding? I love stopping practice for 10 minutes. They came and I was like, okay. It was one of those where it was like, call me in 10 years. They obviously look like they're tremendous athletes, but this story, you know, tough Compton, California. You know, what are the odds of this? When he said, God, it was probably eight years later when Venus was starting to win, he goes, you know something? Venus Williams is great, but her younger sister's gonna be even better. And we were like, I'll have a good laugh about that one too. Serena Williams is the greatest athlete, female athlete, I, to me, I've ever seen in my life in any sport. And she's up there with, you know, Michael Jordan and Tom Brady and Billie Jean King and, you know, the icons of icons. He's gone to the toilet. Okay. This was like a, a hello to the pro circuit for Venus. Uh, interesting because um, it's, it's tough for any player that's on the tour who's a lot older to come up and you're playing a 14 year old and all of a sudden you're losing. So what happens there is you try to find a way to throw them off is basically. And, and unfortunately in tennis, there's certain rules and regulations that are allowed and they're abused. Uh, one of them is the bathroom break, which is basically a try to kill the momentum. And that's in essence what happened in this match. There's nothing we can do. They can't. There's 
She could, she could just oh, say she's in there using it. the toilet. It's a dirty old trick. That's just eight minutes already. That's eight minutes. When I was playing, this is before Venus's time and before Serena's, we, didn't, we weren't even allowed bathroom breaks, which would, you know, tense you up a little bit. You know, I mean, if you absolutely couldn't wait anymore, I suppose there were certain exceptions, but there was no rule for going to bathroom break, bringing trainers on the court, things that are abused. You know, you could argue that we did, I did things that threw people off, uh, my behavior. This is another form of that, um, in a way, and I think it's just as, to me, it's me speaking, it's just as bad, if not worse. This has been an issue that, it's interesting that they brought that part up, and I didn't recall it at the time, and I don't know if they embellished it either, I'm not sure. But I know that it happened to, to a certain degree, and so it exposes certain things in a sport that aren't as nice as they could be, let's just say that. As you can imagine, folks, people have asked me over the years, did you use that uh, technique where you get mad at the umpire so your opponent was, you know, his level of play will drop? And I'm like, if that's all it took for me to, if I go to open an umpire, think of this, and I go, you suck. Let's just start with that. And that might've been one of the nicer things I said. Do you think that that umpire is gonna give me the call the next time? I don't think so. The truth is, is that it wasn't always advantageous to me either. I mean, you think every time I did that, when people start booing you and stuff, that's a, oh yeah, that feels great. Um, I'd love to have 10,000 people start screaming at me. No, so there were times where I was like, oh my God, you just put your foot in your mouth again. This is just pathetic what you're doing. Um, and you've got to try to adjust this. And so this has been a constant process the last 40 years of my life. Wimbledon. Fuck. Oops, sorry, wrong court. That's a drill actually, you know, hit a, co a cone or a, uh, a can of ball, whatever it is that we try to do when you hit shots on a, with the serve, so that is something that uh, they recreated accurately on a court, because certainly you want to be able to hit your spots. That's important. I'm not sure I would have done, with all due respect to Kirsten Dunst and Paul Bettany there, um, who are very fine actors. Little bit difficult to recreate, like the serve effectively, realistically. I would have tried something different had I been the director of Wimbledon. I remember way back in, um, God, I think it was 1984 or five, and I did a video, a tennis video, with my arch nemesis, Yvonne Lendl, and I believe at the time we were number one and two in the world. And it was something along the lines of, you know, filming something to inspire people to play tennis to music. But the point of my boring, hopefully not, story is that uh, we were supposed to hit certain spots and, you know, we had to recreate it like in a particular way so that the camera could film us just right. And we were, as I said, one or two in the world and we were having a tough time doing that. I'd like to tell you we did it every time, but we didn't. And so I can commiserate with these actors who obviously don't play much tennis. You can tell by their strokes. Uh, which is why I would have tried to hidden it a little better for those, for the sake of them. Because it's not so much the story of what's happening on the court, it's more like a love story. It's got a lot of interesting angles that I would have focused more on than the actual tennis part, but that's just me. Hit this one, and I'll sleep with you. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Too bad, you could have used the workout. I can relate to that part. Right? If you hit the, the can, I'll sleep with you. Um, because then you had a lot more motivation to do that. Um, and that's why you choke. Royal Tannenbaums. That's 72 unforced errors for Richie Tannenbaum. He's playing the worst tennis of his life. What's he feeling right now, Tex Hayward? I don't know, Jim. There's obviously something wrong. Yeah, I don't remember this movie that well. And one of the reasons is is I couldn't take it seriously at all, But which was basically, I think, the point. Um, and then you had uh, this Borg lookalike, uh, you know, trying to sort of, uh, I don't know, like to me, it was sort of make a mockery of the whole thing. 
So I didn't get the sort of ingenuity of it at first, in a way, like sort of the spoof of it and the fun of it. Um, I suppose in retrospect, having watched it, you know, parts of it on and off over the years and parts of it right now, that it's funnier now to me now than I thought at the time. Like, oh my God, you know, what, what we need another lame ass, you know, tennis movie or someone making fun of it in a way and whatever the hell he was doing on the court. That's not us, you know, we're more professional than that. I did like quite a bit that that was at that the old Forest Hill Stadium, which, you know, historically for me, that was the first match I ever played was on a court right next to that when I was nine years old. So for me, that meant something. That club is where they used to play the U.S. Open until 1977, so there's a history there. So they got that part of it as well. Um, I ball boyed there when I was uh, growing up for two, three years at Forest Hills. The first match I ever played at, at the U.S. Open was there. So that, you know, money, memories flooded back for me just as a kid growing up there, what that meant to me, even though it didn't have much to do with what they were trying to pull. So I know Wes Anderson, he's a nutty guy. I don't know him, I should say, uh, but I know from what I've seen, he definitely has a different take on things. And certainly, um, if he was looking to get a different take on uh, tennis, he certainly succeeded. Yeah, I find it like interesting that um, it's sort of uh, ahead of its time in a way, because now, you know, all we're talking about is mental health in a way, and sort of, I'm not sure, you know, if, if, if it's a combination, maybe he's trying to thread the needle in a way between having fun with that, but then, you know, how do you deal with it if you see it and if someone does something crazy? He's like tapping out before your eyes and it's like, you know, how do you deal with that? It brings back memories for probably me in certain ways when I was losing it for my opponents to, you know, he's, this is outrageous. He's causing me problems with my concentration. So uh, I think that uh, he succeeded in being a movie that made you think quite a bit. Thanks so much for joining me in this. Uh, hope you enjoyed the clips. Uh, see you next time and be well.